Welcome back to the Imani Project. I'm Nicole Annika Hamilton, and it is going to be a great day. It's already a great day because I have the opportunity to spend it with all of you. So welcome again to today's conversation. I am so pleased, overjoyed, let me tell you, to welcome to today's conversation the wonderful Gordon Shadrach is sitting down with me today. Gordon, welcome to the Imani Project. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Well, listen, you just made my day, let me tell you. You have. You've made my day because I am looking so forward to having a conversation with you today about all of the wonderful work that you do in community. And I feel the need to start off by saying thank you. Thank you You're for welcome. all that you give. <laughs> yes, that for all that you give to community. Thank you for that. And so, Gordon, let's get into it. I'm I'm curious to know, how are you doing? Before we talk about anything else, how is Gordon doing today? Uh, uh, Gordon is doing well. Gordon, uh, <laughs> Gordon is doing well. Uh, I'm adjusting just like everyone else is to our new reality um, and finding challenges. It's been a very interesting a uh, couple of years, uh, I think we're all experiencing a little bit of burnout and we're looking for a uh, little bit of brightness in our day. So, uh, and spending time with you is my brightness for today, for sure. Oh, listen. Okay. Well, you know what? That's all I needed to hear. Interview is over. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> Best one I've given ever. This is amazing. Best and fastest, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for those kind words. You know, I've, I've, uh, as I began the preparations for today's conversation, I was thinking about what it means to be an artist and especially an artist in, in this time right now. You know, as we sit here, as we watch so much happening around us. And that's why I enjoy having that conversation about how are you doing? Mm -hmm. Because I think those words mean something so much different, Gordon, than they did two years ago. Definitely, definitely. Um, I know that it's it's even hard to ask people how they're doing now because everyone, as soon as they start to say, I'm doing well, and then they say, all things considering, or there's always some mm -hmm. sort of caveat at the end. At the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of people were saying that um, as an artist, this should be a time when I should be expressing myself uh, creatively. But I, I felt um, uninspired and I think most likely worried about the future. Mm -hmm. um, you, when you are you know, when you're doing art, you want it, to, at least for me, I want it to come from a place of, of joy. I want to bring some sort of element of, I want, it, I want it to come from a good place. I don't want to create art that is torturous or um, traumatizing for people. Um, so if I do do things that are in a serious nature, if we're looking at the history of, of white supremacy in Canada and things like that, I want to do work that uh, brings light to it, but I also want it to um, come from a place where um, it doesn't uh, create a narrative of, of victims. And I don't want it to come from a deficit lens. I want it to come from a place where there is control over the, over the narrative of what's happening uh, from Black people. Mm, that's really powerful because now I, it leads me to ask, what about those times as artists, and I'm going right in, now, <laughs> now I'm going right in. Right. What about those times as artists when there, we do feel like there is a lot of darkness or hardship, hard times mm -hmm. around us, and we don't feel like there's a lot to pull from in order to create a narrative such as what you've suggested in those times when we want to create a narrative such as what you've suggested right. or, or art as right. what as you've suggested, what about those times when, you know, we don't really feel like there's something positive to pull from because of darkness that may be happening around us? So I'm curious well, I, to know your thoughts on that. And it, perhaps maybe even if, if that has been uh, an experience for you. Almost definitely. I think um, the pandemic really taught a lot of people that it's okay to pause um, you know, that we should give ourselves time to, to grieve, to breathe. I actually had to learn how to grieve, um, you know, with some things that went on in my life. I just, 
Uh, I think a large part of that is as, and I, and I attribute this completely to growing up black in Canada, the idea of stoicism, of always having to look strong, of always having to keep yourself together at times and, and, and keep producing and keep working, even there are times when you are torn up inside. And I think, you know, as, as a young black man, I was taught to, you know, to always look confident when I'm in public. Um, you always look like you belong, even if you don't feel like you belong. Um, it, you know, I was brought up by parents who had very strong ideas, of which I agree with, uh, but it really stemmed from the idea of dignity politics, of when they go low, you go high. Um, but at that same time, we're not allowing ourselves to feel weak. It's it's a human, uh, it's a common human, you know, it's in our nature to want to to shrink and, and, and retract sometimes and to go away. And uh, I think as artists, we need to give ourselves that permission. As Black people, we need to give ourselves that permission to say, you know what, I'm not okay. Um, I need to take a moment. I need to take a beat. I need to pause. And I, I think that's okay. And I think what comes from that rest comes the creative creativity. That's when the creativity is reborn. When you're pushing through all the time, you, you're running on empty. When you give a chance to pause, you, you have a chance to refill and then that's when the creativity can start again. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's oh so good. And I feel what also comes from that rest is uh, some rejuvenation. Yeah. I can think about times when I've uh, said that, you know what? Yes, I need this. Yeah. I need to just stop. I need to pause. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, there's but it's creation. Hard. Oh, it it's is, hard. right? It is hard. Because of the pressure, I, I feel, there's mm -hmm. often that pressure to uh, to keep producing Gordon, mm -hmm. when exactly. we are artists and, and as black people, the, the constant pressure to keep producing and uh, having to prove and fight, yeah. right? You know, <laughs> it's yeah. a fight. And whether the fight is done being quietly, whether it's done, as I said, being stoic and being appearing strong, uh, whether it's speaking up, um, whether it's correcting people, whether it's choosing to react or not react, that takes so much of our energy. Um, and uh, I, uh, you know, as I was saying before, I really had to learn to recognize that it's okay to just step back. And I think, you know, with what I call the reckoning of 2020 with George Floyd, you know, so many black people, we all stepped up, we all spoke out, and then we all said, this is too much. <laughs> we are not your emotional racism Sherpas, you know, like we have to step back and give ourselves uh, the time uh, to process what's going on around us as well. Yes, yeah. And the too much I found a lot of times came from being put in the position of having to teach. Yeah. Yeah. Having to teach. And teach with patience. Yes. And teach with understanding. And um, I mean, I'll be quite honest. I, I had a moment the other day where I was discussing with someone and something was something with a white woman and she refused to, she did everything wrong. If you want to look at those books on how to have a conversation with, you know, anti-racism, anti-black racism, she did textbook everything wrong. Wow. And I lost it. Like I couldn't remain calm. I couldn't remain patient. I, I lost it. And, you know, we, we've spent so much of our time having to be these, these calm, patient people, uh, hoping that people will listen to our words or look at our actions and re or even have the ability to really reflect on what they're saying and what they're doing. You know, uh, I think, uh, you know, after, you know, during the reckoning and everyone coming out and talking about so much, I, I realized how prevalent it was, uh, this ability as black people to be so self-reflective and so self-aware all the time about the context and the conversations that we're having with people. And then, so to have this, this moment just recently where I was addressing something that dealt with racism and I was just dismissed consistently by this person, even though what she was saying was actually proving my point <laughs> consistently, I, I lost my patience and, and I lost my temper. And I think that's fair. I think it's, it's, you know, like we can't continue to be these people that have to sit back and wait uh, for people to have these epiphanies uh, or to, we've waited long enough. We've waited mm -hmm. so long for acknowledgement and understanding. And, uh, and 
it's 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 exhausting. It really is exhausting mm. to be so patient all the time. Yes, I highlight that word exhausting. Yeah, I do, because in the face of what you've just shared, there is also often that feeling, and you've said it really, that feeling of of um, I'm going to say it this way that sometimes it feels like we're not allowed to respond because if we do respond and in many cases with anger or frustration, mm -hmm. then we're proving their point mm -hmm. of that stereotype that mm -hmm. they have matched to black folks, to black people. Right. And so a lot of times it's like, no, we're not allowed to get angry because if yeah. we're angry, then we've proven their point. If we're mad, yeah. we've proven their point. If we're upset, we've proven their point. And so there's been this space of, of, uh, of not allowing, not making room for yeah. us yeah. to be upset. And think about our mental health. Think about how that impacts our mental health. Yes. Think about, you know, when you talk about not getting upset, think about even just getting stopped by the police when you're driving a police car. You know, the amount of emotions that go through you that you have to suppress, that you have to, you know, be in control of. You know, I know stories of people who are white that can get angry at a police officer. You know, they're like, well, I got stopped and I told him off. And I'm like, what? <laughs> no. wow. I, was like, I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> so that's when you start to really understand privilege. When you start to understand that when you actually really see and experience the, the double standards, when you hear people that you know expressing things um, without even batting an eyelash, that was their experience like being angry has enabled some people to get out of getting a, a speeding ticket mm. you know and i'm like yes. how is that even possible like you know so we think about what we deal with not just in those situations but as you said like every day when we're, when we're looking at what we choose to respond to sometimes even having to even acknowledge that acknowledge that something racist is actually happening because sometimes you're just kind of living your day, you know, you're just kind of going through something and someone was rude or something and, and you have to sort of process, what did I just see? You know, like, uh, you know, standing in a, in a line back pre-COVID, you're in a coffee shop and you realize that the person at the counter is super friendly and chummy with everybody until you get to the counter, they barely acknowledge you. And then the next person goes up, do you speak up or do you say something or do you, you know, or do you just accept it, you know? I choose to speak up most of the time. Most of the time I will say, you know what? You barely even looked at me, but you were so warm and friendly with everyone else. Mm. Um, or I'll speak to someone else who's working with that person. Just as a way of saying that I see you, like I see what's happening. Yes, I see you, this moment. Yeah. You know, yeah. We, have to, we have to let people know that we see it. And, you know, if they can justify it to themselves for whatever reason, like I, I still see how I get treated differently when I go into certain coffee shops during COVID now too. There's an expectation as a black man when I walk into a coffee shop, I'm going there to pick up like an Uber Eats order. <laughs> you know? I'm, I'm not going in for my own personal order. You know, they think I'm, I'm there to, to as a food delivery person. There's nothing wrong with being a food delivery person, but the assumption is that that's usually a feeling that I get, you know, like that they're not really seeing me as they're seeing me for, I couldn't possibly be their actual customer, you know? And these are the little things that, you know, you look at and you see and you, that they're little things, but they build up. They really build up. Absolutely. They do. They do. And I, I'm interested in knowing because you've done so much work, Gordon. Um, when we think about the disruption of colonial constructs uh, and having that happen through fashion, uh, or pardon me, through art and fashion, um, yeah. and I fashion, mean, yeah, in right. my work, yeah, <laughs> yes. And so I, I know that your interest in particular does lie in that intersection and codification of race mm -hmm. and fashion. Mm -hmm. And so where did that begin? As, did it begin as far back as you being a 10-year-old? Where did that interest in that intersection happen for you? Way back, <laughs> way back. I mean, I was born in Canada. I was born in Brampton. 
And often we were the only black family on the street. I was usually the black, only black kid in my classroom. And um, the city has changed a lot since I was young. Um, but it was when I talk about that idea of dignity politics, it's the idea of you had to look good. You couldn't be judged. The expectation was that if you looked respect, respectable, that if you carried yourself with dignity, then people would treat you with respect and with dignity. Um, but, you know, I can, you know, jumping forward, I can say it didn't work <laughs> for the most part. Um, but yeah, it was really instilled in me by my, my mother. Uh, my mother uh, really loved fashion. Her her mother was a seamstress and my mom sewed and I taught myself how to sew at a really young age. I think I was about 14 when I taught myself how to sew. Um, and so this idea of understanding how uh, clothing uh, imparts messages um, to people, I was really aware of at a very young age. Uh, I think I, I can, you know, I've told people I remember being, you know, in church when I was like four or five and I think I was around five and uh, a little white boy looked at me and I remember him just looking up and down at my clothes and stopping at my shoes. And I remember feeling really judged by my, by, about my footwear. Um, but I remember that day so clearly, like I remember it. And I remember thinking, what's he looking at? Um, and so that's when I, I really started to, I know it sounds silly because I was so young, but it is something that I was really aware of from that point on about how people looked at you by how you were dressed. Um, it, it just, it's just always fascinated me. And then not even, you know, just necessarily by the, the you know, with, with, from the white gaze, also recognizing that, you know, within the community, if I dressed a certain way, um, it made me, might make me look different from what people expected. And um, yeah, there was a lot of that through high school. I was, I was new wave in high school. So I had a Grace Jones flat top, you know, I was yes. shopping at Le Chateau. Uh, so, Le and Chateau. That was all, way back in the day. So, <laughs> and I made a lot of my own clothes. So I was, I expressed mm -hmm. myself a lot through how I dress. And actually that's why I stopped going to Catholic school um, because the, they were introducing a Catholic uh, school, high school, and they were going to introduce uniforms. And I, said to my mom, one of the only ways I can express myself as a teenager is by how I look. Um, so I would like to go to the public high school like my brothers did, because then I can at least, you know, represent who I am by, by what I choose to wear. And so in that light, um, the exploring of the biases that are embedded in North American culture and looking at how fashion um, and how fashion speaks to humans, how it communicates to humans. I'm so curious to know what, where was the interest or where did that interest for you begin as well as it relates to the portraits of Black men utilizing fashion? Was it in those moments that you've just described or did that slowly begin to, to grow thereafter? Um, it grew from a very organic place. When I first started painting, um, it started off as a hobby. I self-taught, so I just started painting, uh, basically uh, being dared by my partner <laughs> to start painting because I, I wanted a print of a bow tie and he told me to just try painting it, so I painted it. And from then I just started painting. And a lot of the painting that I did usually focused on fashion. And actually, it also focused a lot on shoes. Um, and I kind of, I, I was happy with that work uh, because it wasn't, I didn't think, First of all, I didn't think I could paint faces. So I thought, oh, this is the best way to paint portraits. You don't have to paint a face. I'll paint parts of people's clothing. Um, and I also felt that to some point that I was doing a job of representation by non-representation. Because you couldn't see the faces of the sitters in my portraits, you could sort of imagine that they could be anybody, any race, any gender. Um, but eventually I realized that that's kind of weak. Um, with regards to the importance of representation. Um, and so um, when I eventually started painting uh, more faces and I painted myself and other black men and, you know, I, 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 I met art patrons that were so thrilled to see black people represented in art. And so it just kept building from there. So then I just focused on the idea of really doing a lot of black men in portraiture because it just wasn't really seen. It wasn't what we were being shown. and the media, the way black men are often presented in the media, 
are, are usually, you know, stereotypes. And that's something I've also been aware of since I was a child, and in particular from my dad. Uh, he pointed out all the problems with how Black people were re represented on TV as I grew up and the lack of representation on TV when, as I grew up. So uh, I had two very, I, I had two parents that really taught me how to view the world with a critical eye. Um, and I attribute a lot of how they raised me to who I am today. Um, but it was in paint, deciding to paint more portraiture and focusing on Black men, that's when I also realized um, how the idea of clothing, uh, I could bring forth my understanding of the complexities of clothing, um, mostly because as soon as I started really focusing on painting Black men, uh, my artwork became political. Um, <laughs> the, the representation of Black people in art is in itself an act of politics and talks about our society. Um, and uh, that was so shocking to me that I was now all of a sudden, by putting black sitters in my paintings, that I was making a statement. Uh, it couldn't just be enjoyed for just the art. Mm. But then that led me down the whole, you know, rabbit hole of how do I present them? And what do I put them in? And what have we seen historically? And what was shown, what wasn't shown? And so that's when I really started exploring the idea of how I could use what I chose the sitters to wear as part of those political statements, part of the ways of getting people to look at art with a critical lens and looking at art history with a critical lens and also looking at what they appreciate more critically. Um, I think that's the important part is, I'm on a bit of a tangent, but the art world is, inc I have discovered that the art world wasn't as progressive and as open as I would have liked it to have been. Um, and hopefully things are changing now. Um, but it was fascinating to me to realize that, um, you know, often self-taught black artists are called outsider artists you know? <laughs> and I can relate to that feeling for sure. It was, it was a very, it's been a very interesting passage is, is what I'll, I'll say for now. And in that stance, I, I want to quote you on something that you said, which I think really does shine a light on on all of the above, is what you shared, that you seek to disrupt this colonial construction of portraiture by inviting viewers to reflect upon the depiction of Black people in art and culture. Yeah, and a lot of that really uh, stems from the lack of, of representation that's happened. I'm seeing more art being, you know, now, which is amazing. But the fact that, you know, when you start thinking about what is Canadian art, for example, you know, is the idea of a Canadian art, a picture of a black man, you know, sitting casually in a chair, you know, why isn't that considered black? Why isn't that Canadian art? Like what, how do people define what art is in Canada? And um, it's interesting because right now I'm actually having more work go to the US than I am staying in Canada. And I was told when I first started doing my painting that I should, you know, go to the US. And I said, Canada's big enough. Like, you know, you know, we've been here for a couple of hundred years. You know, I'm sure, sure people are gonna get it. Um, but it it's 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 a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard market to crack in Canada. It definitely is. Um, which is why I'm so compelled to continue to do it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I talk about how uh, the things I was, the values I was raised with, and, you know, my dad would always say, you know, you, you can't complain about something unless you're going to do something about it. And so, you know, I'm at a point in my life where I shouldn't be hearing the stories that I'm hearing from young Black artists about their experiences. It shouldn't be happening. Um, and so, you know, for every time I felt rejected, it just kind of made me push harder. Um, but I have to say that with, again, with the, with the fact that I also had a full-time job as a teacher. And if I was solely looking at being an artist, when I first started doing my black portraiture, um, you know, I had an income that supported me that allowed me to do what I wanted to do. Um, and I know as a young black artist, it's really, really hard to be able to have that commitment and have that time and have that energy. 
uh, um, you know, you have to support yourself to some degree. Um, so I was able to say every time a door slammed in my face, well, I'm just going to push down the next one because I also knew I had a job, you know, so I could continue to do what I really wanted to do. Um, but that's why I want to do it so that the younger generations and the emerging artists don't have to have those struggles, so that they can do the kind of work that they want to do and be successful at it. Yes. Yeah. And let's talk to those artists, Gordon, because I want to take a step back and, and ask you about the, the training, the preparation. Um, what has, has that looked like for you in order for you to be able to do this work and to put yourself out there as an artist, which we all know, especially when we're doing it in the way that you do, is very public. It does take a lot of support and the training that I've mentioned and, and many different things, whether that's also mentors. You know, so can you share a little bit about some of that preparation that has supported you in this journey? Life, <laughs> the, school, the school of life. <laughs> uh, I started painting, you know, as a, as a mature man, um, but I'll, I'll give you a rough outline of my life. Of my, uh, I went to, School in Brampton, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And eventually I, I decided my parents had always encouraged me to study and do what I loved. Um, I had parents, I had immigrant parents that were teaching, telling me to go into fashion and or art. And I was saying, no, that is ridiculous. Uh, I will not do that. I need to get a job. Uh, but I eventually got myself into art school. I went to OCA, uh, OCAD U now, um, and I studied textile design. Uh, so with the goal of actually becoming a fashion illustrator, uh, that's where I thought I could actually do some work. And uh, I left that, I left school early uh, when I got a job in visual display. So I started doing um, visual display for like menswear stores and um, uh, like some major companies. And then eventually I got into working at a cosmetics company here in Canada and I started working in their creative department and I created product displayers and things like that. And it was interesting because all of that came a lot from connections. It really wasn't from, I wasn't trained to be an industrial designer, but, uh, you know, you, you make wonderful connections, you show you can do the work. And, you know, I think that's the really important part is understanding um, that you will be recognized for doing the work. Like you put in the work and ideally you're recognized for it. And then eventually um, I decided to go back to school and become a teacher. Um, so then I had to finish my degree <laughs> at OCAD. Um, and I took a few courses. I finished my, my, um, my textile degree. So I actually am a textile, you know, that's what my, my bachelor's, my degree is in, is in uh, textile design. And um, I finished my teaching degree, went to, became a teacher. Um, but I, I've taken a few painting classes here and there, but I never really studied painting. Like, you know, you would take color theory, you would take all that sort of stuff uh, in art school. Um, so there was no formal preparation really for entering the art world aside from life experience. And, um, you know, I have a supportive partner as well, which has been amazing. I think having someone or people in your life that can support your vision. I just, actually, I didn't even have a vision. Uh, I just started painting as a hobby. Um, and so, you know, people kept telling me, oh, you should show your work, you know, so I got some work in coffee shops and I started doing art fairs. And then that's where I got a lot of my life lessons. When you, when you have the opportunity to go to art fairs, you're engaging directly with art buyers. And I know with COVID right now, there's so many different hybrid models of art fairs. So it's a bit challenging. Um, but that's also when I realized um, that I wasn't seeing a lot of Black people at these events. Um, I wasn't seeing a lot of Black artists, a lot of Black patrons. Um, and I know because people think would think that there's nothing there for them. Um, and eventually when I got to do the Toronto Outdoor Art Exhibition, um, that's when I really, really engaged with a lot of young Black people who were just surprised just surprised that we could actually even be there. 
And that's when I went, there, there's a problem here. <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's a major problem when, you know, it was like, I don't remember, 2017 or whatever. And, 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 young, and black youth and emerging artists are saying, oh, I didn't, I didn't know we could actually enter into these things. Um, you know, and because he doesn't see it, you know, the whole idea of you can, if you can't see it, you can't be it kind of thing. Um, so that really is what pushed me to keep going was recognizing that it just didn't make sense that I was at this stage in my life. I'd been on the planet for that long. And here were black kids who were experiencing racism in ways that I hadn't even experienced it. Um, and so I, I just felt motivated to keep going. And then that's also when the, 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 the community activism kind of fired up in me uh, with recognizing that, um, you know, someone has, like, there are people out there fighting for, you know, our emerging artists. Um, Absolutely. But, but everyone feels like they're doing it alone. You know, like, I think the problem is a lot of people don't recognize that even as artists, you just kind of get locked into your studio and you, for connect, you forget to connect with other people. Um, and so we're, if we all fought together, <laughs> you know, it'd be less work and less, less stress, uh, which is why I like mentoring. And I've done some mentoring through the NIA Center um, because I think it's really important um, to, to, to know that there's someone there supporting you and who believes in you and uh, who can encourage you to keep going when you're ready uh, and to remind you that it's okay to take a break. And I hold tightly onto what you said about the the, the lonely part. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it can feel lonely because when we're also, I think about times when I'm creating and in those moments, the, an idea comes to me that I really want to be able Ooh. to put out there. In that moment, Nicole is very much alone mm -hmm. in that thought process, in, uh, in in trying to structure that idea in my mind. And sometimes I don't want it to be structured at all. Mm -hmm. And so there are those moments of, or have been those moments of, of feeling that loneliness. Uh, but I really enjoy what you've said about mentorship as well, because it's through relationships with mentors that, and other artists, yeah. that so many times, as you've mentioned, I'm agreeing with this, that so many times that feeling of, or that experience of feeling lonely in that moment mm -hmm. can often start to drift from a loneliness to an experience of collaboration or an experience of feeling cared for in spaces and knowing that there are other artists as well who've had those experiences of feeling lonely at times. So I value the mentorship and mm -hmm. I value those opportunities to be able to make connection with yeah. artists. So yeah, yes and, and yes. I think the idea of collaboration is such a, a wonderful word, but I think people forget how broad it can be. Um, I love to collaborate. I love you know, when I worked at the cosmetics company, it was literally a bunch of us just sitting around talking about stuff going, wouldn't it be great if we did this? And then someone's like, oh yeah, we should do that. And then we should do that. And then the next thing you created something, um, you know, it wasn't always about getting, taking the credit for it. It was the idea that you can have a seed and then someone else starts giving you the fertilizer and the water and, the whole bit, and it becomes this thing. And um, I love that as, uh, about being an artist. And I think this is where I actually have a lot of issues with the gallery system the way it is in Canada um, because you know I collaborate with the, the so I, I have representation with the gallery now and I you know I've been wanting it for years but I was ignored overlooked whatever people didn't think I was the right fit for a number of years you know and so eventually when I when I joined a gallery you got a contemporary in Toronto I was really really happy because it gave me a space so if, when I was coming up with the ideas for my show, I knew the space. So I knew what I could create. And in working with the gallery owner and director, it really also allowed a level of collaboration where I could start dreaming about things and saying things offhand. And, you know, you know, Burke, who's now my friend, would say, you know, oh, you could do this or how about that? And all of a sudden we're like, yes. And, and so 
it's your work, but the idea of being able to talk about it with someone and to expand or someone could also say something to you like, oh, why don't you try something like this? And I'd be like, no, no, I could never do that. And then eventually you start getting these ideas in your head. And it, again, it's the idea of planting that seed. And I started doing a whole, you know, a series of work that I was really happy with, but it all came from one little suggestion that, you know, someone once made to me. So yes. collaboration doesn't necessarily mean that we have to like, I'll do this half and you do this half. <laughs> collaboration is just just sharing, like just sharing ideas and talking and exchanging energy, you know, in a way. And uh, it's so much fun. Like I, I'm really glad that I had those experiences as a young, you know, person starting in my in work that I was able to work in display because so much of that, especially back then, was about collaborating. It was all about problem solving. And I think that's what collaboration really is. It's about looking at how do we solve these problems? How do we solve these creative issues? How do we solve the, the construction, the concept? And, and you work with other people to, to get together. And I, as I said, I'm fortunate that I've had experiences that I've seen how that can build into something beautiful. Yes, yes. It's about knowing the why in the collaboration. Yeah. Yes, knowing the why rather than just... I want to work with you yes. because of the fact that you're great at what you do. Yes, exactly. Well, two people coming together who are great artists, that's that's a wonderful thing. But if there's, an, there's not an answer or an understanding of the why, mm -hmm. exactly. then where do we go from there? Exactly. So knowing the why, yes. Yeah, I love that. It's yeah. a great, I like knowing the why. I call it problem solving, but knowing the why, it's the same thing. You know, so I think, yeah, I, I think it's, I think the energy that you get with other people and, and talking about your work, good or bad, can drive you. And, you know, I talk about collaboration, but I also talk about at those art fairs, I think I've encountered ignorance, I've encountered racism, I've encountered mm -hmm. people who, um, you know, even in the, not just in the art fairs, but even in the art world, like it's, it's been very hard to I, I won't lie it's been very hard to get where i am now um you know the number of people black people that are represented in galleries in toronto is starting to grow but it's still disproportionately low um and you know and this is one of the things that also happened in, in the summer of 2020 you know when all these arts organizations and galleries started supporting you know with the black square support you know to show that they supported on social media they posted their black square and then everyone was like hold up <laughs> black square from you you've done nothing you know to support uh black people and they got called out and rightly so and that was such an important moment in you know for so many organizations because they had to put up or shut up you know, and it's a slow process. It's slower than I'd like it to be, but, you know, it did hold them accountable and it did empower Black people to just jump on those platforms and say, no, no, you, you don't have the right to say that you support Black causes because look at you. <laughs> like, there's nothing that you have done to show that. Um, and that includes a number of private galleries in this city. Like it's, it's ridiculous how many black artists are, are not represented in this city. And so given that when you walk into a gallery and you see your work there, what does that do for you? I have to be honest. It's still really surreal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, is, it is very surreal to me, um, that, um, where my life is right now because this was not part of the plan uh, at all i was going to be a teacher i was going to retire you know um and uh live my life simply uh but um i'm so happy it makes me really happy to see my work and to see the effect that it's having on people um it makes me feel really proud and you know both my parents have died but um mm -hmm. it makes me so proud of my parents because I know that um, this was their doing. This was, you know, to have two parents to encourage you to 
study art, <laughs> to study what you love is so rare. Um, and to support you with that and um, to embrace who you are in your entirety. Um, I, I know I'm very lucky. And so when I, when I go into a gallery, I see, um, I see the nurturing of my parents and I see uh, a hopeful future, a positive future, a hope, a more positive future. Definitely. Thank you for asking that question about how, uh, how, what do I like, how does it make me feel? Like it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing because it, it's, I think part of, Part of the surrealistic response in me is probably based on the stoicism aspect of of not of keeping keeping some of those emotions close to my chest in a way like I I don't I don't allow myself to get over elated. <laughs> um, Why is I, that? I well, part of it is the feeling that when you and you would know this as an artist you you see you get offered things you see things happening and you hear about oh this is going to be this amazing opportunity or this person loves your work things are about to happen and the first few times that I got that feeling I'd be like I get really happy and then it didn't it would fall through and so then every time something really positive would come my way i'd be like i I became i had this mantra of it hasn't happened till it's happened so until something really like that next big jump that next level up has right. until, until it's happened it, it hasn't really happened um so i don't allow myself to get too excited about um future events or, or future opportunities until it's happened and i think what's happened is that even when I get to that event and that's happened, I still don't allow this well to open up because I'm still waiting for the other shoe to drop or something. Mm. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's probably more about self preservation. I think than uh, you know, you're hopeful, but it's such a unpredictable, for lack of a better word, marketplace, you know, it's such an unpredictable world. And um, it can be challenging. And it's in order to stay um, emotionally healthy, I think it's, it is wise sometimes to not allow yourself to get too caught up with things. Mm. Which isn't the most positive I, thing to hear, but I, I'd rather be more cautious than be disappointed, I think. Mm. I'm pensive. I'm thinking about what you've just shared because... Uh, we could have a whole other interview on what you've just shared because that that's so deep. Because what I'm thinking about right now is how many times it is that so many of us have created something oh so beautiful. And we've, we've shared that with the world. We've shared that with community. But we've not allowed ourselves to be elated or to rejoice in that moment. So, you think it's about, there's, sorry, go it, ahead. Sorry, I interrupted. I was just, as you said that, I think part of it is also humility. If we're taught mm. humility, then you, you don't know how to shift from humility to showing that joy. I think it's, it's hard. It's, you don't want to come across as being boastful or overly proud. Um, I don't know. I wonder at times, could it be fear for some of us? Fear about that other shoe dropping. Most definitely. I I definitely think that there's a, a part of imposter syndrome that we all feel now and then. And I think um, I think there is fear. I actually think there. I I have gotten a sense that some emerging artists are fe are fearful of being successful mm -hmm. and i am tr i have tried to talk people around um self-fulfilling prophecies of doom uh, <laughs> you know i'm trying to get people to understand that it's okay 
to push and to dream and to to get. So I feel like I'm contradicting myself a bit here, but um, there is an element of, and I think this is probably this may be something that is so specific to the Black community of not necessarily knowing what to do once you've leveled up because we haven't seen enough of it around us or maybe we're not you know it just isn't encouraged as a society um that getting to that next level is something that you become afraid of instead of wanting to embrace absolutely yes oh gordon let me tell you we got to, we, the, I, I'm already seeing it, another conversation, whether, <laughs> whether it's over tea, over tea or something, because that is so big, so big, what to do when we have leveled up and not having seen that we have had many, many beautiful examples mm-hmm. of individuals who look like us succeeding mm-hmm. and thriving and producing we have seen so many examples. I, I'm so interested in what you shared there about those of us who don't know what to do next. Part two, Gordon. I see a conversation. <laughs> I see a conversation coming I, up. I, I would love to have a conversation about that because yes. there, there is no roadmap. And that's the hard part, right? It's, it's You're right. still navigating as you go. Right. Absolutely. Well, I want to also draw attention to, you have such a a wonderful backdrop right now, some frames that we're seeing behind you. And I want to draw attention to the fact that a lot of your finished work is, um, or your work, your paintings rather, are finished in damaged antique and vintage frames. Is, is, can, can you share a little bit about where that inspiration came from and where that started? Oh, there's, uh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, well, it is because when I first started painting, uh, one of the first things I uh, you know, discussed with my partner and other artists was, should you frame your finished work? You know, So if you're going to show your work at an art fair, there's also the fear that if you frame it in something that people don't like or doesn't match your decor or whatever, you're limiting your audience. And so my first initial paintings of, of fashion uh, sort of paintings were um, unframed. Um, when I decided to start exploring um, and focusing mostly on black men in my portraiture, I was inspired to use the, the frames um, because I started doing a whole series of black dandies. So I started painting uh, men uh, from the Edwardian and Victorian periods. And so once that started, um, they seem like a natural way to finish the work. And I really, you know, and from that, I realized that the frames became part of the narrative. The frames became part of the story and it became part of a larger issue with regards of representation in history, in art, in Western culture. So I felt like the frames would um, not only add to the narrative of the picture, of the painting, uh, but also... Uh, acknowledge and recognize gaps, historical gaps, where Black people were not represented uh, in visual arts in North America and Europe. So those frames sort of fill that gap. They kind of look back historically about these times and actually want people to question why we didn't see more uh, representational art um, in those periods. Yes, yes. Thank you for that share. Gordon, and thank you for today. I know we're coming to a close, but I've got one more question for you. Oh, no. One more, one more, Gordon. <laughs> and it's really about you shared so many things with us today in terms of your journey. And I think a, a, a question that I'd love for you to answer now and, and share with uh, individuals listening um, are words of wisdom for aspiring artists, educators, art makers, creatives, words of wisdom that you can share. And in particular, if you wouldn't mind highlighting in those words of wisdom, how to be able to, or your suggestion rather, of how to overcome roadblocks. Because as Black folks, as artists, creatives, et cetera, Oftentimes, there's so many different roadblocks that are coming at us. 
Yeah. And so how do we create in the face of those roadblocks? How do right. we survive and thrive? And so words of wisdom, I leave you with one last very heavy question. Oh, my gosh. Words <laughs> of wisdom from Gordon. Oh, no. well, that at all itself is a, is a whole other conversation. Um, so <laughs> I don't know where to start. It's such a big question. I think fundamentally is to connect. Uh, keep your connections going. Um, you know, I think connecting with other people as creatives, um, create your little salons of your artists and writers and musicians and and create by creating those groups, you're allowing yourself to thrive. You're allowing to collaborate and bounce ideas off of people. you're you're allowing yourself to be acknowledged in positive ways. Um, I think, and it also teaches you to be open. And I think that's a really important part it, um, for creatives is to be open. Um, you know, you might have some really strong ideas, but that's great. But you need to acknowledge that there are other things that can influence you uh, in good ways. Or, you know, even if it's a negative thing, then, you know, acknowledge how that doesn't come into play in your work. So it's it's always about being open and connecting. I think... And that being said, that is an important message to educators <laughs> to be open. Um, and I think that's where so many young emerging artists and designers and creatives uh, hit a major roadblock is that, uh, unfortunately, our educational system isn't really um, always open to um, non-colonial concepts with regards to creativity. And that is a massive roadblock. So this is more for the gatekeepers and the educators that they really need to start looking at the validity of other ways of expressing uh, art and understanding that they have value and importance. And if it continues to be shut down and blocked, um, then society doesn't progress. Um, by saying this is what we know and this is what we like, so this is what we're going to stick with, and then there's no moving forward. And I think the gatekeepers and educators need to understand that it's going to keep moving forward with or without them. And it's easier to go with the flow <laughs> with the people that are coming through and saying, hey, I've got these ideas, than to constantly diminish the efforts of those people. Um, it's still happening, and that's what I find incredibly depressing and disheartening, is that there are educators who, you know, who believe in um, what they do, but they've lost the ability to be open to seeing new ways of having things done mm -hmm. um, and appreciating it. And um, in that case, it's it's really challenging for young people, but I think. I think an important part of it when I talked also about the connecting is actually looking for mentors and asking people to be their, your mentor. Um, and hopefully they can help you navigate around and through those, those situations. Uh, a young man um, asked me to be his, his mentor and he got me at a time when I was open to it. I, I can't, I've had a few, so there are times when I, it's a little bit overwhelming. Um, but, uh, you know, he took the risk and um, he, and I know he reaches out to artists all the time as well. So he communicates, um, you know, to a lot of people, DMs them. And, but I really enjoyed the experience of working with him and watching him grow and flourish. Um, I also think that people need to believe in their work and publish their work, which means that it needs to be shared. Um, if you're doing work and you're not promoting yourself, and I don't mean that in the whole, like, you know, expensive way. I just mean... Social media, I mean, my life actually changed a lot with Instagram. Um, that's how I reached so many of my American buyers initially um, was through social media. Um, and so that is a real game changer. And during the pandemic, I sold a lot of work through social media, <laughs> which was also surprising to me. Um, and be proud of the work that you put out there and be proud of your name. And I think that's something 
that I've not fully wrapped my head around why um, and maybe it's because they're young and they're evolving, but when I see an artist that I like and I can't remember what their Instagram handle is because it has nothing to do with their name, I find that really frustrating. <laughs> so be proud of your name, use your name, you know, like your name is your calling card. Your name is how people recognize you. So find a name that you like and stick with it. Um, or I use the name that you have and stick with it. Uh, but really feel confident in what you're doing. Um, enough so that you promote it in a way that's uh, effective. Words of wisdom from Gordon Shadrach. Sorry, I don't know if those answered your question, but <laughs> it's just I'm basing oh, on what I've seen and uh, right. on, and my experiences with uh, with some young people, and unfortunately with some people in the educational system as well. Words of wisdom and beautiful, beautiful shares, Thank Gordon. You. Thank you for making history with me today. We are making right. history by simply having this conversation. And I thank you for that. It's been so wonderful to sit down with you. Thank you for joining me on the Amani Project and having the conversation. It's been wonderful. Appreciate been, you. I really appreciate being here. So thank you very much for having me. My pleasure. Oh, what a joy it is to listen to the words of Gordon Shadrach. I think that it's it's so meaningful to have conversations such as these now and to really consider to really consider even just how it is that we are creating art and the question of the why. So so much so much to think about and so much more is coming up. So we look forward to having you join us again. I'm Nicole Inika Hamilton. This is the Amani Project, and I look so very much forward to sitting down with you again soon. Bye for now.